Timon part 2, lesson number 12. It's called Ayah. This lesson is called Ayah. And this is probably, I guess you can call it the second most important lesson in, in the Kutimoran. After Azamra is this lesson Ayah. And they work together, these two lessons. Like Rav Nosson said, that if now, we spoke about this many times, that a person sees that Azamra is not working to find the good, so then he has to cry out to Hashem. Fine. So I'm just holding where we left off last year. I, I'm going to continue. We didn't finish the lesson last year, so we'll continue at the point where we left off. It's a one block, this lesson. It's not broken down into chapters. So the section that we're beginning, it begins like this. It's, it's in, in the English translation, it's part one. Tw- lesson 12, chapter one. But it's long, chapter one. <laughs> the whole lesson is chapter one, basically. So it begins like this. Ukesha'adam no these words appear after a small bracket. You'll see it says Ayan the Kutei Aleph Siman Yutet. If you can see, if you want to see it in your book, I'm going to show where it is. So it's part two, Tinyana, lesson twelve, Yudbet. So he explains the idea of Targum. He finishes explaining the, the idea of the language called Targum, which is in between holy and the unholy, the pure and the impure. If you want to see, I'll show you where it is. Yeah, Kamuva ve'alken k'tiv bilshon Targum. Yeah, where are you? To our youth bed, right? Lesson 12. Now you have a long way to go. Here. Hello. Uh, Mom, it's the bottom line. The bottom line. The bottom line over here. Right over here. Okay, fine. So he explains. Okay, Shadam. No fair, no sham. See that? Well, I can keep with the Sean Tagum. Okay. So on the top, the top line of the second column. Okay, well, Ukishadam no Fedesham, when a person falls there, he says he falls to the evil force called the Noga, which is the admixture of, of pure and impure, and that's where the darkness emanates from. And it can't be darkness which is from the totally impure, because a Jew, no matter where he's thrown into, he's always, has, he's always connected to holiness. So always a Jew is in the category of Noga, no matter where. Even if a Jew sins and he's thrown into darkness, the fact that he's a Jew, he has a drop of holiness, and he's going into darkness is the mixture of the pure and the impure. There's Noga there. Already there it is. He is in danger of being eaten up and swallowed up by the evil. But he's being there. So the situation has Noga. So now he explains. When a person falls there to this darkness of this klipa of Noga, this brightness which corresponds to the in-between between holiness and impurity and it's made up of good and bad like the tree of knowledge of good and bad which is the idea of the filthy places he's going back to the, the beginning of the lesson we spoke about that a person can fall sometimes very 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 low into the category of sin and blemishes and being far from Hashem and they're called filthy places he feels he feels it the person has fallen into places which are filthy. So then, when he seeks out and cries out, Hashem, where is the place of your glory? Where are you? In other words, he's calling out from the depths. He doesn't just get absorbed by the evil. Rather, he's broken because of it. This happens because there's no God. There's the admixture of good and bad. So even though he's in the darkness, the good is there to remind him that there is still a God. Just that he can't find Hashem in this situation. He's been thrown into a filthy place. I didn't, I didn't see at all Hashem in this place. And that's what's leading him, pushing him to call out, Hashem, where are you? This itself is his rectification. The fact that he's calling out Hashem, that's the way to get out of the situation. He's being squeezed in order to call out to Hashem. In other words, he's thrown into this dark place. And the darkness is to push him to call it to Hashem. How this works in light with Azamra is that Azamra is if there's a darkness, but I can find a little bit of good to hold on to, to connect to in the darkness. I can find some good points in my darkness. So then it doesn't apply this teaching. This teaching applies when he's totally knocked out the person. He's totally broken. He's just, he just sees the darkness in the filthy places. And he can't find anything good in the situation that gives him life. And even if he does find a good boy, a point, but the darkness is so overwhelming him, it's painful that it doesn't help the good point. So he has no other choice than to cry out, Hashem, where are you? 
And he's saying to doing that, this is his rectification. This is his rectification in order to get out of this place. Because he goes back by doing so to reconnect to what's called the upper glory. Just a recap that he mentioned, there are 10 levels of Hashem's glory in the creation. Each level of glory is connected to one of the 10 statements that Hashem used to create the world. To go back to the Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, chapter 5, it says there that the world was created with 10 utterances. In other words, in the, the first section of the, of the Parsha Bereshit, Genesis, so you'll see if you count how many times it says in the six days of the seven days of creation, including Shabbat, it says Vayomer Elokim, Vayomer, Vayomer, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said. You count them. There's nine times in the seven days of creation that you have, and the Lord said. So the, the, it says number. It says there's ten. You know, we count as nine. So the first word Bereshit in the beginning is also a statement, but because it doesn't say. Vayomer, it's, it's, it's what's Bereshit? Bereshit is like a, 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 an action happening. Bereshit, in the beginning, it's, like a, it's a place, it's happening. And there's no saying, there's no utterance here. So the, the Gemara teaches, it's called Ma'amar Satum. It's called a concealed statement. Bereshit is Ma'amar Satum, a hidden, concealed st- statement. It's really a statement. It's one of the ten statements of the creation. But it doesn't say it overtly. It's not expressed clearly. It's hidden. And Rabbi Nachman teaches in this lesson, that first statement is to give nourishment and sustenance for the parts of creation which go against Hashem's will. In other words, everything which is evil, everything which goes against in creation the belief of Hashem, like for example, atheism, idolatry, people who do actions which are against Hashem's will, murder, adultery, idolatry, all these things which are against Hashem's will, yet they're part of creation. Hashem created them still. It's part of the creation. Hashem gave room for free will to exist, that people can do bad, that bad can exist. But it's an, it's an existence. And all existence comes from Hashem. So how could Hashem be the source of creation for evil? And it continues to, it, it, it's existing now, it continues to exist because it's receiving nourishment from Hashem. How could that be? It comes from in a concealed manner. And it's, that, that emanates from the, higher, the highest utterance which is the first one, it's called Bereshit Ma'amar Satum, that gives nourishment to all the situations and categories of impurity, what are called filthy places, which go against the glory of Hashem. In the nine, the nine parts of creation, which, which, which are rooted in the nine utterances, that's the nine sections of all the creation that we see it, which is not necessarily bad. And each one reveals a different aspect of Hashem's glory, like the birds, the nature, the waterfalls, human society, good things that, that exist in the world and creation, they're rooted in these nine, one of the nine, and they come to reveal, when used properly, a proper glory of Hashem, a kavod. But the kavod of the, of the Bereshit is totally hidden, because there's no kavod, there's no glory of Hashem from idol worship, there's no glory of Hashem from people who do, who do sin, who do murder, who do adultery, and all these things against Hashem's will, there's no glory of Hashem coming out of it, so it's a hidden glory. It's totally hidden because you can't say that there's a, a glory in Hashem's the, the, the sinning, yet that it received that it receives from Hashem not nourishment. So there is a hidden glory. So when when a person is thrown into situations of darkness, filthy places due to sin or or sinful thoughts or atheistic thoughts, and he's not connecting to Hashem. So by calling out, where is the place of your glory? You're looking for the glory. The fact that you're looking for it means that you believe that it exists behind. That's why you're calling out, where are you? Where's the glory? So this is how to reconnect. So that's what he's saying now. Here. By now, calling God, Hashem, where's the place of your glory? I don't see you. I'm so far from davening. My emunah is down the drain. My, my yot shemai, my fear of God is so weak. I'm so far from you, Hashem. And I don't do good things. I don't wash my eyes. I, I'm not. I'm not in a holy situation. Not in a proper situation. Everything seems miserable and down. Where are you, Hashem? Where's the glory in what I'm going through in my situation? So by doing that, he goes back and reconnects. Shav. He returns to what's called the upper glory. The upper glory is this glory which is hidden and rooted in the Bereshit, the first utterance, which is totally hidden. It's called the upper glory, because in order 
to manifest Hashem's glory in something which, which goes against Hashem's glory, it has to be a very strong dosage, a powerful dosage of this concealed concealment which, is, which has within it Hashem's glory in it. And to do that, to have two opposites in one, that on a revealed level it, you don't see anything. But secretly and undercover, there's a high, there, there's the, there's Hashem's glory hidden in it. It has to be very powerful in order to do that. This dosage. So it's called the kavod ha'elion, the upper glory, which is on overt, overtly. It's 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 totally hidden, totally concealed. We're talking about sins, idolatry, things that go against Hashem. Yet within them is hidden the glory, and by, by of Hashem. And by a Jew who's thrown into such scenarios, such situations, he cries out, Where are you, Hashem? Ayyemikom kivodo. By doing that, he connects to this hidden glory. Shubechinat ayyem, which we said, which Rabbeinu said, Rabbi Nachman said at the beginning of Islam, and the, before we, where we started today, that this is the idea of ayyem. Ayyem is calling out, Where are you, Hashem? Where is the place of your glory? Fine. And that's how you get out, by doing the calling out. Can you, can you explain the calling out? Just in a in a practical sense, is it it does it need to be actually calling out? Is it is it inside? Is it outside? It's it's be, it's be, is it, it, talking? It is it ideally, like, like the Jews in Egypt when it says Vayamari Wad Chayehem, the G- Egyptians embittered their lives, and it says Vayanechu, the Jews moaned and cried. They made an expression, and also it says Vayitzaku, the Jews called out. It is you being squeezed to the, the, a degree that you come to expression, that you're expressing whether in tears. Whether in moaning, whether in words, but there's an expression, ideally. Ultimately, it's the words. He says, you call out, tzoek. Rabbeinu said clearly, as I mivakesh v'tzoek. The person seeks out and cries out, where are you? Oh, Hashem, where are you? You're crying out, tzoek. Literally, you cry to Hashem, where are you, Hashem? There's only so much you can contain within you. A person... And the way of a person is just to swallow it up and to be quiet of what he's going through. But they want to squeeze it out of you. They want you to express it in words. And the words is, the speech is very important here. Why? Because they're called 10 utterances. Asara ma'marot. It's a ma'amar. Ma'amar means a statement. Hashem, so to speak, he said something. It's a speech. So now when a person is thrown to the hidden utterance, Bereshit is a word. It's a word of the Torah, Bereshit. But it's called a hidden utterance. You don't see expressed expressed there, and uh, the Lord said, and Hashem Yom Elokim. It's hidden there, but it requires. It's involved with the faculty of speech. So now, when a Jew now is thrown to the Ma'amar Satum, the hidden utterance, it's called a hidden utterance. His job is to call out with speech from there to reveal Hashem in the in the hidden utterance to feel that the God to reveal the godliness. Hidden in the hidden utterance. And that's by calling out. So what they do in heaven is they apply pressure until a person can't handle it and the darkness is too overwhelming in the situation and he can't just contain it within him and it comes out in words. His heart, the build up in the heart swells up and comes up, comes out in the expression of words. It's true expression in, in, in articulation. Yes, it has to be expressed with the mouth. Aye. He said, so ek, to scream out, ayyeh. We have no sin in the prayer on this lesson, prayer number 12 also. And the, the prayer there is to, where are you, Hashem? An kedushati, where's my holiness? Where's my purity? Everything was taken away from me. It's expression in words in order to do this. It's not just in thought. It's to express it in words, yes. Okay? So now, he's going to connect us to what he mentioned earlier. We, again, last year we saw this of a, what's called a burnt sacrifice. Ola, korban ola. Ola literally means to ascend. It's called an ascent offering. Why is it called an ascent offering, korban ola? Because everything ascends on high. Nothing, no part of the sacrifice was eaten by not the Kohanim and not the people who offered the sacrifice. It was totally burnt on the altar. So it went up. It's what's called ola. And our context is gonna connect now Ayeh, crying out to Hashem, to being as an Ola sacrifice. Ola. Because it's Korban Ola, meaning to get you back out of the darkness. Ola, to come back up, to get out. Okay? So look what he says now. (laughs) 
Okay. Mizeu bechinot ola. This is the idea of a, a burnt ascent, ascent. That's literally, but the burnt sacrifice ola bechinat. Like it says in the whole story of the binding of Yitzchak, right? That when Avram and Yitzchak were going together, and Avram didn't tell him that he didn't tell Isaac that he's going to be sacrificed. So when they went, they had the fire. And they had the, the branches, the twigs to make the fire. And he had the knife, Avraham. So Av- Yitzhak asked Avraham, I see the fire. I see the wigs, the, the twigs, the branches to make the fire, to make the actual burning. But where is the sheep, the se, right? For, for making the, the lamb. So that's a better word. The lamb for the, for, for the burnt offering. <laughs> Oh, Hashem, some, some simcha in the class. So where is the burnt offering? Where is this, the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? Where's the actual animal? Where's the sacrifice? So look what he's saying. Rabbi Nachman is rewording the question. And not saying reading it as a question. Yitzchak asked, And my father Avram, where? Ayeh means literally where. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So Rabbi Nachman reads it like this. Ayeh, dash, what is Ayeh? Ayeh equals, in other words, not dash, just equals. Ayeh, where are you, Hashem? Ayeh, where? Is equivalent to Hasele Ola. Is the lamb for the burnt ascending offering. Shebechinat Ayeh, hi bechinot Sele Ola. Ayeh, where are you, Hashem? Where is, the, where is your glory? Where are you hiding? This is the concept, the aspect of the lamb for the burnt offering. Which is what? Letaken. We said earlier in the lesson that a burnt offering, this is an, uh, that was in the parsha Tzav, last week's parsha, that an Ola, a burnt offering, comes to atone for what? It comes to rectify and atone for thoughts. A sin offering, a person did a sin, he brings what's called a korban chatat, a sin offering. So what is a burnt offering brought for, if now not for sins? For bad thoughts. That even though he did no bad action, but he was thinking about bad thoughts. So this sacrifice, the burnt offering comes to rectify thoughts in the heart. And in our context, Where do these thoughts, in other words, bad thoughts come from, that come to engulf a person with a bad feeling, bad emotions, it, it, it ruins his emuna, it ruins his fear of God, these bad things. This bad way of thinking, Sheba mimekomot hametunafim. It comes from these filthy places. In other words, that a person has fallen into low places. So one thing is to bring a sin offering for the actual damage he may have done. But there's an after effect of falling into these places. Is that there's like a, a bad taste afterwards. There's an impression left on the person that even if he t- technically stop doing the bad action. But he's now influenced now by being exposed to that domain of a filthy place and it causes him it causes him bad thoughts. And even if he may not have necessarily done a bad action, still pondering about bad thoughts can lead a person into that domain of the, and being connected to it. At the beginning of the lesson, he, he mentioned, I'm trying to remember what it was that I just wanted to say, he, he mentions the idea of, of thinking, beginning to think thoughts of heresy. The person begins to have doubts about Hashem. And that doubts of Hashem is what's, what's the, which means basically that you have doubts that Hashem is actually watching you, that Hashem actually cares about you, that Hashem actually listens to your prayers, that he, that he exists there, you know, all types of philosophical questions that enter a person's mind. He didn't, may not have done anything, but he's pondering about such thoughts that's already entering him to the domain of the filthy places that cause him this darkness. The darkness could be that he doesn't see the answers to his questions in the Torah anymore. He has questions and he sees the Torah is not answering them because he's caused some type of a blemish in his thoughts that now are ruining or breaching his emunah. If he had emunah, with the moon itself, it strengthens to see his answers in the Torah. But now that there's questions on the emunah which are attacking his emunah, the Torah can't help him anymore to see the answers. The answers are there, but the person's the problem. His emunah has been tainted because he pondered such thoughts which are ruining the emunah, 
and therefore the Torah cannot, can no longer help him because he doesn't have the, the, the prescription, the glasses of the Muna to see the answers from the Torah. So he has no choice but to cry out, where are you, in order to get out. So whether through sin, whether just through pondering thoughts, but these are, the, these are the, the thoughts which are generated by the filthy places which cause this darkness that I have to get out of. So, Because through, the, again, through the concept of Ayeh, you rectify and Ole. You see, he wants to stress that's called a Korban Ola. It's called a burnt offering. Ola, because you actually get out. You ascend from there through Ayeh. By calling out Ayeh, it's like an ascending burnt offering because by say, calling out Ayeh, where are you Hashem? You actually get pulled out and ascend. Get up, get out and go upwards from this filthy dark situation which is below. Okay. Huh? Now this is the whole idea of what's mentioned at the end of the Tikkun Izor. Something amazing here. There's a question here really. It says in the end of the Tikkun Izor, it's called Tikkun Tinyana. At the, how works the book Tikkun Izor? Is you have what's called the 70 chapters, the 70 rectifications, which are 70 chapters giving different, different configurations of the first word of the Torah, Bereshit. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Tikkun Izor rearranges, re- rearranges the, the letters, Bereshit, in 70 different formats. Can you believe it? 70 different formats explaining 70 different perspectives and combinations and expressions of the word Bereshit. After those 70 chapters, there are additions. There are another set of additional rectifications. And this is called Tikkun Tinyana. Okay, at the end of the Tikkun, it's called Tikkun Tinyana Daf Aleph. At the end, like the addendums in a way, if you want to call it. Addendum number two. Bereshit, another combination they give besides the 70, Rabbi Shemur Bar gives is Bara Taish. Bereshit, Bet Resh Aleph, Shin Yud Tav have the letters also of the creation of the Taish. What is a Taish? Taish, believe it or not, is like a male goat. And the Khatam Sofer, he, he asks or brings down on this Zohar or the Midrash that a Taish is not necessarily like a Seh. A Taish is like a male goat and a Seh is a lamb. So he explains that the Taish is, connotes severity and the lamb, the Seh, connotes softness. That's why a lamb is very gentle. You take a lamb, you can move it. A goat has much more azut. It's called an ez. The Hebrew term for the for the, the goat family is ez, which means chutzpah, holy, holy, holy boldness, or boldness, ez, azut, right? So the taish is the male and he's tough. He has the stronger horns and it's a tough animal, but it was offered as a, as a sacrifice, but it's not the lamb. So why, why the interchanging of taish as referring to the lamb? because of the mitigation needed. The Khatam Sofer explains that, I still don't understand it fully, but he says, the Khatam Sofer, that the Taish and the Lamb were interchanged. So the Taish is referring, the Taish is referring to the Lamb, which is a soft animal, but it shows that it's interwoven growth, severities, and, and, and loving kindness. Okay, we can't go that much into it because it requires more development, but just, it's a point on the side that Taish is not a Lamb in Hebrew, in the Hebrew the, the vocabulary, in the Torah dictionary. Fine. But he says, This is referring to the Seh for the Ola, the lamb which was offered. That's Baratayish. That in explaining the Tikkun Izar, that Hashem created already the, the lamb, the, the Taish, the lamb which was going to be used instead of the off, instead of Yitzhak on the, on the altar. Instead of Yitzhak being offered, was created, Rashi brings it down also on the Chumash, that already from the beginning of creation, this lamb, the sacrifice was created, was prepared beforehand. And, and was waiting to be used as an exchange instead of Isaac, instead of Yitzhak on the altar. So that's Bara Taish, that's what the Zohar is referring to. And again, the Khatam Sofer asks this question, Taish said, but it's referring to the same animal. So we're going to see what Rabbi Nachman is trying to tell us by bringing in this Zohar, that Bereshit is Bara Taish. What does that help us? So watch. That now, this, uh, we said, the Sela Ola, is, is basically Ayeh, like Yitzchak said, Ayeh, Hasel Ola, Ayeh, calling out to you Hashem, where are you, is equivalent to the Seh, the lamb which is used as the burnt offering, right? So it's, it's made through the idea of Ayeh. 
So watch this. Shehu bechinot bereshit ma'amar satu. That's why it's hidden. It's hinted to in the word bereshit itself. Because we said that when a person calls out ayeh, what he does is by calling out Hashem, where are you? In this dark situation, which is so dark that it's, re- re- it's, it's receiving its nourishment from the hidden utterance, that's Bereshit. What is the hidden utterance? Bereshit. And in the word Bereshit itself, you have Bara Taish. So this is like another proof of Rabbi Nachman's bringing that Ayeh HaSel Ola is, is Bereshit. He connected, first of all, Ayeh, calling out to Hashem, where are you, is equivalent to the Se. The lamb, which is for a burnt offering to get you back up. And now that back up is rooted to the Bereshit, the hidden utterance. That's the second proof now of Bereshit with the letters Bara Taish. Hashem created this Taish referring to the lamb sacrifice instead of Yitzhak. That's what the Zohar is trying to say there, the Tikkuni Zohar. So this is another connection between Bereshit, the hidden utterance itself, and Bara Taish. The same letters in there. Two proofs Rabbi Nachman brought. One from the Ayah Selola and one from the word Bereshit itself. Fine. It's a question. Why does he have to bring two proofs? That's part of learning in depth. Why Rabbi Nachman brings, he, he should have been satisfied with one proof. He already just proved Ayah Selola and I already see the connection. But Rabbi Nachman went a step further and brought another proof from the word Bereshit itself. Bereshit bara taish. Vizeh bechinot tshuva. This is the idea of tshuva, repentance. This is the essence of the tshuva. This is amazing. This is the essence of tshuva when a person seeks out, right? Looks, looks and seeks out for the glory of Hashem. And he sees in himself that he's, a, that he's far from the glory of Hashem. And he's pining, he's yearning out of, out of pain which is developed because of his yearning. That he's, he's asking and he's again pained, saying, Where is the place of your glory, Hashem? This in itself is the essence of his, rectific- of his repentance and his rectification. As mentioned above, again, he re- we said this already, but he added more detail, and he adds these two words here, v'haven heitev. Understand this well. At this point, I just want to say something important. Rav Nosen, it's Rav Nosen the key, who's showing that this lesson is connected to Azamra. Lesson 282 of part one. They're connected. They work together. What did he say there in Azamra? He said that you have to find, you have to judge every person favorably. Right? You have to judge everyone to the scale of merit. And even if you see someone who's a complete rasha, you have to look for him good points. And by looking for his good points, you actually bring him to, to the scale of merit. And then he adds these words, And then you can cause the person, bring the person to repentance. And then later on, Rabbi Nachman says in that lesson 282, so too of a person himself, he has to find his good points and do this process of looking at the good, even if it's filled with all types of negative things, to keep on looking for the good. And again, he says, and then you can follow the pathways of Chu. You can come back. What does he say here? That this ayah here, ikar tshuva, is the essence of repentance. The actual repentance itself is ayah, meaning azamra, Looking for the good points is a preparation to come to the tshuva, which is essentially the essence. He says, ikar tshuva is to get to ayeh, which is when when a person in the darkness seeks out Hashem, this is the essence of the tshuva. So again, to look at the whole picture again, azamra is a preparation for the tshuva final process. To get to the, the tshuva process, you have to be a warrior in t- that you're holding on. The only way to hold on and to, in order to finally get to the essence of the tshuva is by looking for the good points. To survive, survival is finding the good points. Survival, being positive, I can sing Hashem to Hashem with my good points, all that is to be able to hold on 
to all the tur- during all the turbulent waters that you're going through in life, I have a zamra. I have the good points. That's giving you sustenance. But it doesn't rectify the bad that was lost. When there's bad through sins, through lack, loss of potential good, I could have done these things and I'm just looking negative. What was lost, Azamra doesn't necessarily go out to fix that part, the negative part. Azamra helps you to maintain, to survive right now, to hold on and to, be, and to begin to eventually enter the pathway to do tshuva. By holding on, when they see in heaven that you're ready now to get back what was lost, what you lost from this darkness, from the sin and whatever, so Aye, Aye, now calling out to Hashem, where are you in the darkness, is the key for getting back from the darkness, the light hidden in there. So it works together. Azamra is the patience needed. For whatever reason, Hashem feels now is not yet the time. You have to hold on still. You have to find another good point, another good point, another good point. And you have to keep on finding and collecting the good points and sing to Hashem with it and be positive and be strong. That's what maintains you. However, you're gonna, you, you need to uh, give an accounting at the end of your life for all the days of your life, all the actions, including the bad. And I want to get back the bad, to turn it to good, to transform my bad days, which are bad. Because we said again, Azamra, like you said last week in Bir Likutim, the Azamra doesn't mean to justify the sins. No. You, the sins st- stay sins. But I'm focusing on the good. By looking at the good, looking at the good, so Hashem also looks at the good and gives me always chances and chances and chances. When is the time to rectify the bad? When does that come? Aye. At Aye, when you, when you go back into the dark situations and you call out to Hashem, where are you, Hashem? I don't want to be here. I want to come back to you. By calling out, that rectifies the darkness. Sin offering, fine. Khatat, korban khatat, the sin offering for actions. But we said the damage caused the darkness which, which is generated from sins or from bad thinking, that requires rectification. That, is, that, is, that will rectify the, the, the bad, the bad points, which the, the repercussion was this darkness. To get out of it is through ayah. And he's saying here, Ze'ikar tshuva. This is the essence of the tshuva. Whereas again in Azamra, he says you can, through Azamra, you can do tshuva. It's not the essence of the tshuva. It's part of the tshuva process, Azamra, to get to, like we said last week, to get to the maror. We spoke about the maror. To get that in the maror, you're calling out to Hashem. In the bitterness, the darkness, you call out to Hashem. You can only call out to Hashem in the darkness if you've invested enough in life in Azamra, in being positive when you were supposed to be positive, when you could have, when you should have. And that was the thing that they expected you to do in life, to hold on to the good. And then when comes the time that they want to give back to you all the potential good that was lost because of the dark situations, then in heaven they throw you in a situation of ayah, of total darkness, and you call it Hashem, where are you Hashem? That elevates all the dark moments in your life. So they work together. Azamra is the preparation for ayah. What happens at the end is that ayah transforms the darkness to light, because by doing that, by calling out to Hashem from the darkness, you're revealing that God also created these, this hidden utterance, that Hashem is the source of the hidden utterance, Bereshit, which is the source, the root for this dark situations, this dark way of thinking, this negative, atheistic, philosophical, idolatrous, negative picture, filthy places that you're in now. They're, they're, coming from, they're rooted from the Ma'amar Satum, and now you're re- revealing the glory of Hashem even there. It's no longer hidden anymore. You're revealing it by calling out to Hashem. You're supposed to be here, Hashem. I don't see you. And I'm calling out. I'm not just saying, oh, Hashem is not here. I'm calling out, Hashem, where are you here? In the dark situation, where are you here? This now collects, transforms the darkness into good. So that, like Rav Nassim said there in Eruv Eitchumim, the Kutei Alachot, Eruv Eitchumim, Alachavav, that now you can be happy with these newer good points. That now the bad becomes transformed into good through the sin offering, the burnt offering of the ayeh, which is this burnt offering, right? It's the, 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 the korban ola, which is ayeh, that now transforms everything into good. And then you go back at the end to azamra. In other words, the goal is, yes, to be happy, but to collect also what was left behind to get that back also. It's amazing, these ideas. So now he goes on. Look at this. These lessons, 
are not Rabbi Nachman verbatim. It's not Lashon Rabbeinu. It's not word for Rabbi Nachman. Rather, Rav Nossin wrote it, and then he went over with it with Rabbi Nachman. Okay, this is one of these lessons. So he adds Rav Nossin. This is what Rabbeinu said. He heard it from Rabbeinu. From Rabbi Nachman. There are many other items connected to these concepts we just mentioned. Now, he gives an example. Like, he gives like, uh, the ideas which are much more. And Rav Nosen and the Kutei Alachot, he, he explains this distinction. This basically, at this point now, starts, you can say, the end part of the lesson of the, of the, of the, of the Torah. What we spoke until now was really the introduction, the first part of the Torah, uh, what, what, what to do, Aye. Now he gives like a different dimension of it. The dimension of the tzaddikim. Watch. Ki kishadam holech baderech. For what for? When a person travels on a path, and he's more specific. Oh, kishah holech badrachim beruchaniyut. Or when a person goes along the path, the path, pathways in spirituality, spiritual pathways. In other words, uh, when it says spiritual pathways, it means pathways of contemplation, of your perception of Hashem, of godliness, ide ideas of the Torah. So what does he say here? Azai haTorah holechet lefanav. So when a person is going on the pathway of holiness, of spirituality, the Torah goes before the person. HaTorah holechet lefanav. It goes in front of him. We're going to explain hopefully this idea. Bivchinot. Like the verse says in Mishlei, it says in Proverbs chapter 6, Behit alechecha, when you walk, when you go, Tanche otach, the Torah will lead you. In other words, the Torah is always with a person. When a person learns Torah, what the Torah does, it's always with that person. Meaning what? That you can find Torah in everything you're doing in life. Someone who's totally connected to the Torah, totally, at the highest of levels, and he tries to find, he's always looking for Hashem in life, that's not just, not just learning dry, just the gymnastics of the Gemara, that's part of the picture. Part of the picture is to go, uh, the, the, the whole picture is the whole pardest, all sections of the Torah. From the simple, from the drash, and to the Kabbalah, the secrets, all in order to find godliness in your life. So with your, that attitude, the Torah leads you. The Torah goes in front of you. For there are many, con there's many concepts, in, many aspects in this idea. Each person has a revelation according to his Torah. This is amazing stuff here. This is very deep. He's not explaining himself that much. He's just, expe just ex expressing ideas and he's not explaining the connection of the ideas. We're going to try our best to make some picture of the tapestry. Bezat Hashem. V'lifnei kol Torah yesh bechinot svekot. And before every Torah, there are the doubts mentioned above. The doubts which are created from the darkness, the concealment of the awareness, which he said earlier, it's called the filthy places where there's darkness, you don't see Hashem. So he's saying also when a person is on the pathways in spirituality, in other words, when a person wants to develop and reveal Torah ideas, he also has to go to a, a, a type of an aspect of darkness, which means now, the first part of the Torah talks about a person, mamash, literally goes into dark places because of bad thoughts, because of negative thoughts. But here's talking about someone who's already on the pathway of spirituality, and he wants to develop Torah ideas by saying that the Torah goes before a person that, and he's on the pathway of spirituality, he's trying to reveal the Torah as he's walking along the pathway because the Torah is in front of the person. That means the Torah prepares that, uh, for a person that he can find the Torah on the pathway he's taking because the Torah goes in front of him. So it's this amazing idea. Phew. That, that by, by, by looking for the, you're, you're looking, he's looking for revealing the Torah. Because of that, he, ha, he, has, he has to go through a darkness, the, the, the doubts and, and confusions, not necessarily filthy places, but a concealment of the Torah in order to reveal it. He explains, watch, Kegon, for example, Bechidushe Torah, when developing Torah ideas. A person wants to develop Torah insights. Any person. And according to his level, he said. Each person has his level of Torah. You have the person who's just an amazing mumch, an expert in Gemara, Chidushim. And you have another person who's into Kabbalistic Hasidic ideas or nice in, in, insights on the Parsha or on, on the Gemara and stories, etc. Each person, in, in his, according to his Torah. Kodem Shemechat Shin, before a person develops an insight in the Torah, Yishkama Svekot Ubilbulim. 
he has several types of doubts and confusions. Kodem shemivarer umilaben hadavar karaui. Before he's able to clarify and to whiten, to make white and crystal clear the item as is fitting. Karaui. Okay? He has to go through these doubts first. Ve'elu hasvekot hem bechinat etzadat tovara. These doubts are the aspect of the tree of knowledge of good and bad. You see, it's called tree of knowledge. It's in it an admixture of bad also. The good I can understand. But the bad, it's still called etzadat. It's wisdom which is bad. What does this bad part of the tree of knowledge serve? As a preparation to reveal in that bad the deep secrets of the Torah, the hidden Torah there. Shehu bechinat noga. Which we said, the idea of the tree of knowledge of good and bad is the idea of this clip of this evil called Noga, which is an admixture of good and bad. So he had the Torah has to go through there, okay? Because the Torah is also called the tree of knowledge. You have the Torah. The Torah is called Etzachaim, the tree of life, but it's also called the tree of knowledge of good and bad. You have areas of the Torah which have an admixture. The one that's apparent is called the oral Torah. The oral Torah is called Etzadat Tovara. That's why. The whole structure of the Old Torah is machloket. One rabbi says like this, one rabbi says like that. Halacha is according to him and not according to him. We spoke about that, if you remember, on Lesson 62. That the Old Torah is rooted in the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Clear, crystal clear, that's etzachayim, the tree of life. It's also a higher level of the Torah where there's no machloket, there's no uh, conflict. One rabbi says like this, one rabbi says like that. It's crystal clear. That's mainly associated with the deep secrets of the Torah, like the Kabbalah, and what's even higher than the Kabbalah. That's called Etzachayim, the tree of life. But the tree of knowledge is a, a preparation for the tree of life. And in there, you have to do the Beur, the process of clarification. Why? Because for your Torah insight to be complete, it has to be connected to all the ten utterances of the Torah, of, of creation. See, the Ted utterances are also the root of the Torah that's in this world. The Torah is part of the creation. Hashem created the Torah also. The, the Torah is a creation. Hashem created the Torah before the world and then injected the Torah that He created into the world, which means if now the Torah is part of this world, so it's rooted in the 10 statements that we spoke about that Hashem used to create the world, part of the 10 utterances is parts of the Torah. So now, for my Torah insight to be complete, it has to have a connection to every part of, of the utterances, every of the ten. That means the nine revealed ones. That for Torah insight to be true, it has to match and matin, fit in with all the nine utterances, but plus number ten. But you can only connect to Bereshit, the hidden utterance, Mamar Satum, if you first go through a concealment in order to reveal the Torah there. Then your Torah insight is complete. That it has, it's, it's an utterance made up, connected to all the ten utterances. So to do that, you have to go through the doubt, confusion process before developing Torah ideas. You have to. Why? Because the doubt enables you to connect to the hidden utterance <laughs> by being in doubt, confusion. I'm crying out, Hashem, Hashem, where are you in this Torah insight? I have an insight. And I want to reveal the godliness in it, but I don't see in this situation how this Torah here, by crying out to Hashem to reveal to you, so you see how he applies it also to Torah study, that crying out, Aye, where are you in this darkness and confusion? That's how you come to reveal the Torah hidden there. And then your Torah inside is complete. He goes on, you see? When you come to the Torah itself, Okay, after passing through all the, pass, passing the, the darkness and the confusions, <laughs> this is clear. No more doubts. This is the tree of life. And he says, etc. <laughs> because these are ideas which are understood and mentioned in the Kabbalah, in the Zohar, in the, in the writings of the Arizal. He's, he says, etc. because these are ideas which are known and understood by those people who are masters of Kabbalah and the secrets of the Torah, they understand these ideas, these concepts very easily. They see this pattern, how it works. And he's explaining it now in the concept of the lesson that he gave. Fine. 